well. <laughs> I see lots of um, friendly faces from New York and other places. So I, I welcome everyone um, to Rome and to the Gallery of Art of Temple University Rome and to our virtual exhibition, Imagery as Activism, Blacks in Italy and the Art of Taking Space. A presentation of the original works of art by Elena Tomasi Ferroni to illustrate the modern fairy tales of Dr. Tamara Pizzoli. This exhibition is part of our month long program for Black History Month and which explores the diversity of Afro descendant cultures in Italy. The show is curated by Dr. Pizzoli from an idea of Benedicta Jumpa and Emily Kravitz and will be moderated by Benedicta. For this virtual show, we have selected two of the fairy tales penned by Tamara Pizzoli, Fatou and the Cora and Lotus and the Baby Bird. And these will be the focus of the conversation. However, if you should be in Rome for the month of February, we invite you to register and come by the Gallery of Art, which is hosting an in-person, the original works for three of Pizzoli's books to include also of gods and goddesses, deities of ancient Rome. Dr. Tamara Pizzoli is an author, curator, producer, and publisher, and has produced 25 books, often inspired by her children, and which reveal her interest in exploring through a lens of innocence, the racial dynamics and injustice of today's Italian society. The wonderful original artworks by Elena Tomasi Ferroni bring these stories to life. The artist is widely exhibited in Italy and internationally and is known for her fanciful imagination in creating a universe of real and visionary characters. As usual, we will enter the exhibition together with Benedicta and Tamara. Following the conversation, we will allow for a Q&A so please type your comments or questions in the chat. These will be moderated by Barbara Khan. So many thanks to the artists and to our colleagues at Temple University Rome and to the Gallery of Art team. Now, Benedict and Tamara, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Shara, for the introduction and your help as well uh, with the work, the gallery. So we st I will start first with a brief introduction to uh, Black History Month by Temple University. There's a lot of people there. And uh, I will be introducing as well uh, Tamara and we'll have a brief conversation. And then Tamara will go through the work through the help of Emily. And uh, also, of course, I want to mention Janet that have been helping uh, with coordinating Black History Month. So I wanna welcome you once again to the second edition of Black History Month at Temple University Rome. Uh, I'm Benedicta Jumpa, I'm Student Life Coordinator, and I've been uh, managing the different initiatives for Black History Month, of course, with the help of my colleagues. And at Temple Rome, we, we've been working together uh, with my colleagues uh, to ensure that Black History Month uh, is part of our concrete efforts for diversity and inclusion. Uh, we definitely, part of this concrete effort, it means amplifying the diverse voices of our students and our community. And this includes all of our Black students. Uh, it goes beyond like good intentions when it comes to uh, fighting racism and going against anti-racism. Because uh, racism is a structural global issues that impacts the art. And this is goes beyond politically correctness or excessive sensibility. Uh, for this reason, as a campus, we want our community to be connected also to the Black community in Italy. And this includes Afro-Italians, but also Black Americans as well living in Rome. So today we have the honor of having Tam Dr. Tamara Pizzoli today, uh, with us today. She's originally from the US and she's based in uh, Rome for the event tonight, which is imagery as activism, Blacks in Italy, the art of taking space. I had the honor back in 2016 and the first words that I told to Tamara were actually thank you when I saw a book because I had the opportunity to see my younger self uh, in those books, very represented, represented in a just way for which it didn't happen for me between my childhood. And uh, tonight, once again, I say thank you to Tamara for this exhibition, but also for, uh, also say a personal thank you for welcoming me in this city uh, when I was new to this city and also giving opportunities and investing in me. And so it's an honor for us at Temple Room to have you with us. And uh, thank you so much for being with us this evening. 
and we will start with a few questions and then we will I will let you talk more about the work. Oh, we can't hear you. It's a little bit low, but I'm sure like yes. Try and let's see. Yes, I think, yes, I think we got you. Mm, no, still not coming tray. Let's see now. Hmm. Still not coming tray. Let's have a look at that. In just a minute. Do we want to first listen to an audiobook? Yes, yeah, so let's go with the audiobook for sure. Yeah. We have first Fatu and the Cora. Fatu and the Kora, a modern West African fairy tale by Dr. Tamara Pizzoli, illustrated by Elena Tomasi Ferroni. In the West African city of Dakar, not so long ago, in a land once composed of kingdoms and empires that is now known as modern Senegal, there lived a young girl by the name of Fatu. It is a name given to many Senegalese girls who were born in that land. Like many children around her age, Fatou was fascinated by the world around her. She seemed to float instantly and seamlessly between the two planes she inhabited and understood, human and spirit. For Fatou, there was little or no difference between the two. She spent a good portion of her days giving her mama, Miriam, a hand with her to-do list around the house sweeping dust and any possible misfortune out the door, or chopping the herbs and spices so that her mama's famous yasa dishes came out just right. It was in these routine roles that Fatou first learned the importance of paying attention, a skill that never escaped her. She listened with intensity when her mother shared her secrets. The way to make good food, Fatou, my love, is the same way to have a good idea. The more you let it marinate, the better it becomes. In that way, Fatou developed a love and skill for being still and observing. She'd quiet her mind, perched in the kitchen window, intensely following the sagas of the birds and insects. What interesting lives they led, what stories they too had to tell. While the scent of lemon-tinged meat swirled up and around, tickling and enticing all within the home, Fatou's father, Musa, sat on his favorite stump just outside the home, honing his generational gift, playing the kora. You see, the kora, or the African harp, is an instrument unlike any other. It is said that you don't choose to play the kora. No, no, she chooses you. Well, as Fatou watched her father strum the strings of the same instrument his grandfather had played and his grandfather's father and his great-grandfather's father, she knew that this was more than just a matter of paying attention. This was a matter of pull. The truth in both her body and her spirit was this. She wanted to play the Kora. It was for her. Ah, but much like trucks and dolls, robots and dress-up clothes, there are those who think that certain playthings are only for certain children. It was understood by almost all there in that region of Senegal that the Kora simply was not an instrument for girls. But how could that be, Fatou would wonder, enchanted by Papa Musa's playing. 
How could that be when the Cora is so clearly a woman itself? Its hollow belly reminded her of her mother's when her baby brother Babakar was inside and almost ready to emerge, or that of the Yoruba goddess Yemaya, about whom she'd read in stories. Many days passed and things were as they had always been. Fatu helped and observed and watched and listened and read and drew and thought and listened. And then on a Tuesday, she decided she would play the Cora. In her spirit, she didn't feel that her choice was wrong, but she didn't want to get into any trouble or disobey what she knew to be a ruin. Okay. Yeah, you can hear me now. Yes, we can. All right. Thank you so I much for the introduction. But yes. Oh my goodness. Thank you. I was trying to say that earlier. I'm very, very happy, very pleased, and and grateful to be here. Thank you to Temple University, to you, especially Benedicta, to all the, the art department and the staff the faculty that's been awesome to put such a lovely exhibition together. And I also gratitude from Elena Tomasi Ferroni, who's my exquisite collaborator and, and dear friend. She wanted to be here tonight, but scheduling conflicts wouldn't allow, so. That's absolutely fine. Thank you so much once again. As we start with the children's book, I thought like one was starting with a question about children and about color blindness. Um, oftentimes, like when it comes to anti-racism, especially in Europe, there is a color blind approach. Um, and this includes even in Italy. So we normally argue that children do not see color. So we think maybe representation may not be important for children. So what to start actually like with like, why is it important, especially for you, Tamara, to create books? for children, especially in this case, black children, where they can see themselves and the varieties of characters. I think it's of extreme importance to understand that, um, that knowing and seeing and allowing for children to not only recognize something that's as obvious and, and beautiful and um, easily discerned as skin tone is a richness and um, something very natural. I don't subscribe to the idea that children don't recognize skin tone because they do. And to deny that of a child or to say, well, kids don't see color is to deny the very essence of not only the exterior characteristics, but so much of the lived experiences that are paired undeniably to the skin that we all walk around in. So for my stories and how the visual component um, centering black form and high art yields a churning of a spirit, I hope, not only in black children, but all children that allow them to see with a more truthful lens because the art isn't being painted, no, by a black woman, though I do have a very, Ellen is a kindred spirit and I think that the art reflects that. But it's very obvious, I think also through the art that a black woman had an, a very strong hand in the creation of the art. And so many times, especially with artistic projects, um, whether it's trendy or whether it's something that's academic, a lot of times in the arts, literary, visual arts, there are pieces that are created and critiqued and, and disseminated about particular cultures or skin tones that are authored or executed by those who do not partake in the culture. So for me, the beauty is the truth of the pieces because 
they come from a very real place, the stories do in my spirit. And I think that having them translated in such an authentic, gorgeous way by Elena, really, I've seen it firsthand. I've seen children in Brooklyn who have never made, you know, been to Senegal or even heard of it perhaps, but reading at a bookstore in Brooklyn, seeing them recognize not only themselves, but a lineage, a richness, a beauty, um, a, a strength, a love that only, oh, I put my microphone down. <laughs> you can still hear me, right? <laughs> that only art can, um, can transmit in a certain way. I hope I answered your question. Yes, absolutely. I think that's important. And I would like to highlight what you said about the fact that saying that children don't stay colored, that, that denies the lived experiences of people. And I think that's very, that's very important to realize that we do work through this work, work through different experiences. So Aside from the fact that it's just not true. I mean, the yes. American Psychological Association has um, has proven that, that children start to see race and recognize physical characteristic differences from very early on, even as early as infancy. So we're also sliding their intelligence, not, mm -hmm. not bringing it up. And I think the, the deeper issue is how these conversations are happening. I spent a lot of time as a kindergarten teacher. I'm born and raised in Texas. And um, if I'm talking slow, it's because there's an echo. <laughs> Not because I'm particularly thoughtful, <laughs> um, but and, um, that was a joke. Um, <laughs> but I think children are brilliant and so wise and they're able to, to handle these complex topics. Well, topics that are natural for them, but that we may see as complex. I mm. think the danger and where more time has to be spent is the oftentimes, especially with Black children, the psychological assault that comes with the narratives that they are exposed to early on through academics or just what's popular in the publishing industry. So, you know, right now it's Black history. We're going to see <laughs> plenty, a bounty of books that, yes, are historically accurate, we hope, because that's also another issue, but ones that conjure great pain for children. Um, stories of segregation, slavery, um, emotional distress. What happens to a child when they're exposed to that in an environment, in an academic environment? And when that's not just a part of a rich literary diet or even uh, approached in a very, careful way. It's just, all right, kids, we're going to read you this story about how once upon a time, not too long ago, the Black souls are here and the White souls are here and you're four. So I really, my stories tend to, um, to purposely, foc purposely focus on Black bliss and joy and love and beauty and, and just good stories. They're not, I don't consider them black books. They're just good stories with characters that happen to, for the most part, be black. I think that's also important. This is why, this is why we also have this moment, like between Black History Month. Of course, we talk about anti-racism. Of course, we spoke about activism in the past events, but it's important also to celebrate art and also black joy. So. I think why you're like it is absolutely important. So I want to go back to the um, title and uh, just share briefly about like uh, about like the uh, about the actual title. Like why art can be so important for activism, and especially right now you say it specifically in Italy, and also. Um, especially after the year that we had with 2020, where we saw like protests globally uh, with the Black Lives Matter movement. So for the title and why at this moment, I think with the largest civil rights movement in history, 
upon us right now. It feels a little bit more far removed, perhaps, because it just, you know, it's not the summertime and some time has elapsed. And there was very much so, though, a thinning of the veil, I felt, especially during the summer where people who perhaps had never felt called to do so much before or, or weren't really acutely aware, uh, which, you know, for me, from my perspective, I was, I don't, I still, oh, there's an echo going on. Do you have headphones? Yes, I do. <laughs> I do somewhere. I can hear the echo. Oh, hold on, let's see. They're old school, they're not the. That's fine, no worries. Shall we play another one of these stories in the meanwhile while we get the headphones? Emily, we have, I believe we have um, the second book um, we can play as we are fixing the audio. Sorry, that's the first book. Lotus and the Baby Bird by Dr. Tamara Pizzoli, illustrated by Elena Tomasi Ferroni. Lotus had lived on Via del Babuino in Rome, Italy, her whole life, a total of eight years. She knew everyone there was to know in the area. Edis the baker, Federico the sandwich shop owner, Paola the woman who ran the jewelry store right underneath her home, and so many others. They had all seen Lotus grow and evolve from an infant into a spunky kid with a few permanent teeth. As Lotus grew, so did her hair, and she preferred to wear it just as it sprouted from her scalp. Glorious. Naturally, her hair garnered a significant amount of attention from both strangers and those who knew Lotus best. Mamma mia, che capelli! What hair! Strangers would exclaim as she rode her scooter around Piazza del Popolo after school. Others offered unsolicited wisecracks, poorly delivered as jokes. What, did someone scare you today? A stranger would quip. Did you put your finger in the electrical socket and get shocked? Another would grin and chuckle. Otis's mother, however, had long before taught her the perfect response to such unsavory remarks. Tell them the truth every time they ask, she'd instruct Lotus when she began La Scuola Materna, or preschool, around age three. When they ask you about your hair, tell them it is your crown. She continued, and you, princess, are never required to let anyone touch your crown. And that's precisely what Lotus told anyone who inquired about her coils, each and every time. After preschool, Lotus began her elementary school education at La Scuola San Giuseppe, St. Joseph's School in Piazza di Spagna. Now that she was eight years old and San Giuseppe was near their home, her parents permitted her to walk to and from school on her own each morning and afternoon. One Tuesday morning, Lotus was strolling on the sidewalk on her way to class when something plunged from the sky above, just barely missing her nose, and landed with a thud on the concrete right before her two feet. Curious, Lotus bent down to examine what had fallen, 
and her heart sank when she observed a seemingly lifeless baby bird that, she assumed, had plummeted from its warm nest straight to its death on the ground below. Shaken and saddened, and for reasons she'd later spend countless moments trying to comprehend, Lotus continued walking and left the baby bird motionless in the middle of the sidewalk. By the time she reached Piazza di Spagna, an intense urge to help or at least move the baby bird overcame her. She pivoted and returned to the exact spot where she'd last seen the tiny creature. Only when she arrived, nothing but remnants of the baby bird remained. Someone had stepped on it as they walked to their destination, crushing it beyond recognition. Such, such a beautiful like, story. Like uh, I love listening to this story. Like and Tamara, by the way, you have an amazing voice. So like, yeah, it's just lovely to hear that. And I think it resonates a lot with like the team, especially of growing up uh, in a society where people do not look like you and oftentimes because you look different, that difference like gets pointed out, especially in an early age. So some quotes really reminded a lot of my childhood growing up in Italy. So like, yeah, definitely. Like, that's something that really resonates with me. So we were talking earlier about like activism and especially after this year like, and the title uh, behind uh, the exhibition. So if you can tell us a little bit more about that and I see some of our students here as well. I see Emily here writing in the chat that she said, uh, she said, lovely, beautiful, impactful. I love the way it is read. So that's for one of our students for our semester. So if you can tell us a little bit more about like the title and of course with what happened in the last year uh, with the protests, you were tell us a little, you were telling us earlier a little bit about like how like we saw new people showing up in places that didn't show up before. So if you can tell us a little bit more about that. Okay, I think. Uh, no, I think can hear you now. Wait, wait. let's see now. We can't hear you right now. No, let's see. Now we will go for the second part. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. I don't know. I'm just gonna maybe put. I thought like. Okay. Um. Is it two screens or one? Who cares? Go for it. It right. Um, just go with this. So I think the old Joe reacted with this one. Let's go for this. That's the beauty of the life, the technical difficulties at the time of Zoom. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Can you hear me now? Yes. But with an echo. Okay, like let's try now. I'm sure like we got it now. Okay. Um, we can hear you now. So the title with the imagery and the activism for me is um, just an integral part of how I look at life here. Um, this is even pre the whole mm, global visceral reaction to what we saw over the summer with the state sanctioned murder of George Floyd. 
Um, and I believe, like I was saying, a lot of people began to really critically think of their own contributions. For me, I already felt like I was saying what I wanted to say through my books. So for example, my very good friend, Stella Jean, who is a designer here, um, she's the first black designer, major black designer, the only black member of the Italian Fashion Council. Um, and so she called me, I believe the night that his murder occurred and asked me if um, I had plans to go, you know, th there were already talks about a protest. And for me with COVID and all of that, I was like, no, <laughs> y'all haven't. Um, because I really, what I have to say, I, I already say in my work, um, but also everybody has to, activism is like getting dressed. Everyone has to do it in their own way. And it's all important and it's all necessary. So for me being a black American, I mean, she was the first of many calls that I received from friends asking if I would be willing to, um, you know, they were organizing to go down to Piazza del Popolo, which is another point I want to make. Um, just my lived experiences here in Italy, they're, my books are very, very um, autobiographical in a sense. So for Lotus and the Baby Bird, that really happened when I was pregnant with my baby girl, Lotus. Um, but I would experience a lot of very strange things. That's my, we used to live in that area, um, Piazza del Popolo, where a lot of the big protests were happening. And I mean, it's a very chic area. There are not a lot of, of residents that, you know, are walking around with Afros. So with four children, we kind of stick out. And I can, there are not even enough fingers for me to count the number of times I would answer the door and be mistaken for the cleaning lady, for example. So I think just showing um, black life, normal black life, like going to school and having grief about a decision you feel like you could have made better, uh, that it's image activism because maybe it will change a person's perspective or even be an introduction to a, a visual that may not have been seen before. So that's what, and plus, I mean, I've just been doing this kind of work. You know, Benedicta had a, a series called Black Girls in Rome in 2014, 2015, just ex exploring, letting Black people narrate themselves. That's <laughs> what I like. Just, you know, we, I, I can do without the books and the, even the exhibitions that are like, you know, voyeuristic in their approach. I'm very, I've grown very tired of creative colonialism. So, yeah, just being able to have the creative um, autonomy and the complete artistic freedom to say, I think it's a good story. I have the production capabilities. I will get it done. To me, that's, that's radical. <laughs> yes, I think thank you so much for this because especially as myself, I sort of come from, um, I'm also an activist and I think Sometimes there is this expectation that there is only a certain way for which we can be activists, for which we can be um, proactive and create change, but we can do it in so many different ways. And I really like what you said about like, activism is like getting dressed. Everybody does it differently in different ways. And I think that's so important. And I also- And, and I hope everyone the is doing it. We, ho we hope everyone's yeah. getting dressed. It's like we hope everybody's contributing. Yes, absolutely. And I also appreciated the island of the daily life of Black people because oftentimes there is this imagery that it's actually sometimes it goes outside of the daily. Oftentimes it's kind of like stereotyped. Oh, like 
you're fully like understood, like the daily life, the daily contributions and how we live in different spaces in different areas as well. And the, how the assumptions affect like our daily, our daily lives. So I think that's why the books are very important. So I have one last question and I don't know if you would like to highlight any, uh, any words afterwards. So as uh, we if I could also just add really quickly to that, um, it's so important not just for young learners but also older individuals as well. Look at what we've seen in the news here in Italy just this last week with Mr. Seydu, the lawyer who was in Naples. I don't know if everyone heard about that. This man is a, a black attorney, a professional in the courtroom. And there was an honorary judge who was shocked to see that to the point where it, it, I believe it was a woman, she found it incredulous and, and took to leave her post to verify his credentials after having asked for his. So she needs my books too, because she hasn't seen <laughs> enough black people in certain spaces before. I'd we'll like her name sure send it to me. We'll make sure she will receive a copy for sure. She probably needs that. So for the last question, and then we'll look at the work. So we can ask, we, we will have the questions in a few minutes. It's 8.42 right now. So we'll give room for questions. So I see here that, so the last question I have for you is, um, we have students that oftentimes are activists, as I mentioned, and they're going into the future selves. But this does not apply only to the youngest, as you said, but also applies to people like myself, staff members, faculty, attendees, or like tonight. And uh, looking at your creative journey, what would you say to your younger self? Oh my gosh, there's so many things. The first would be to take myself seriously. I think I, um, we just got on a good foot. I'm gonna move a second so I can get to the charge. Um, I think I would definitely say to take myself seriously because you don't know, I don't know, I guess I thought an artist would be like um, something that I wasn't. You know, I was a teacher for a really long time and um, I taught kindergarten and then I owned a school here, always something with education. So for me, kind of feels like you guys are at home with me. <laughs> for me, um, just having the, giving yourself the license to evolve because I knew I had ideas, but I, I, I mean, how many I probably let go, not catching them, you know? And the, the book that's been, been optioned into a, a movie, Tallulah the Tooth Fairy CEO, I, like that was written in like an hour. Um, I, I think all the time, what if I hadn't written that down? What if I hadn't honored that idea? So I would tell my younger self, like trust yourself, trust your gut, trust your intuition, surround yourself with positive, beautiful people all the time. Get rid of the jerks. My mentor Tom always tells me that. Um, and that everything is important. You know, I, I feel like, and necessary. I feel like when I was younger, I had like, I think a lot of young people have um, this idea that problems are bad, you know, like if start, stuff starts going to poo, then maybe it's not meant for you, or maybe, you know, uh, you should try something else. But I always repeat this as advice that adversity guards the door to success. Adversity guards the door to success. So, I, a man named Don Holden in, D, in Washington, D.C. told me that, and I found that to be very true. So now I believe it so much that when it starts like stuff like this, 
like the, I don't know if you all can hear an echo or not, and it's driving me crazy. And, you know, it's just like really funky and it's not perfect. And I like things perfect. Something probably tonight really good is going to happen. <laughs> See, it's just the way <laughs> the energies are. That's just how it works. So, you know, and you need the, all the lessons along the way and you can't. Um, look at how I met Elena, for example. I met Elena because I was going through like the worst time in my life. And um, Elena, the artist, I mean, who created all these gorgeous pieces you all are, are seeing. These are from Fatu and the Cora. So I was the, hi, Marilu, hi. It's not that bad at all. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> See, Marilu. Um, yeah, I, I was going through a really horrible divorce here in Italy. And I think, you know, to speak to this whole concept of racism and what's going on um, with the protest. And I hear a lot of Italians a lot of times say, well, no, Italians aren't racist. You know, there's no racism in Italy. There's just uh, ignorance. Well, <laughs> racism is powered by ignorance. That's an issue you can change. <laughs> so for me going, I mean, I could write, I'm already, I mean, I have my retirement home picked out by the millions I'm gonna make on my memoir about getting divorced as a black woman in Italy. <laughs> Y'all, not for the faint of heart. I will just say that um, I know what Mr. Seju feels like, and it's like as a Black woman, you don't feel like that necessarily at every door. That's not greeting you at every door because, you know, there's also the applause and the snail pass about when you walk down the street, it could be. But even then, there's a fetishization that can be pervasive. It's a delicate balance and all of that adversity, it teaches you to dance in, the, in, in spite of it all and, and to weave gold and to tell your stories. If, if, you can be, if you can be that open, if you can channel it. So for me, I was not channeling anything at that time growing through the divorce. And I was at lunch with my mother at LAFA, one of my favorite restaurants in Piazza Polarola. Y'all go because the restaurants need help right now. And um, I just followed my gut. This is what I mean by what I would tell my younger self. Follow that, the tiniest little inkling that, you know, uh, I want to do this, do it. So I followed my gut and said, I want to take painting lessons. Like that day, I walk across the street, I see a frame shop. And my gut said, go in there and ask about painting lessons, but it's a frame shop. So I open the door and I say, do you, do you know where I could take painting lessons? I've never painted a day in my life. This is in 2014. And the man points to the door and it's like, Elena Tomasi Perroni, lezione di pittura, painting lessons. He walks my mother and me over two piazzas to Elena's studio. And I started painting lessons. I had never curated a thing. I had never, I mean, I was just broken. And so that's my thing. It, and what was waiting for me on the other side of that, this, you know, a, a very good friend. Um, Ellen is my third son's godmother. I have all the babies, I have four. So that's what I would say, you know, don't, don't be so quick to curse the dark times because you don't know, you don't know how it's going to play out and it's always playing out for you well. It's always working for your favor. It's a long answer. Thank you, Tamara, for sharing so much wisdom. I like, yeah, I'm sure like this will be very like, insightful I think for all of us even just for myself I just took some notes and I think it's so like important everything you shared about from adversity about like how racism can be such uh, unfortunately like an intimate experience that kind of felt like 
the marriage, the divorce, and like and gone through the that. custody. Custody. <laughs> yes. You know and, what it takes? <laughs> all the gods. It yes. takes the favor of all the gods and the saints. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much for sharing that um, because that's a, that's a very intimate, very personal. I'm glad you shared that with uh, with us tonight. So I read a comment in the chat, which was so precious, which was uh, from a six-year-old attending with her mom. She said, I like your stories and I like the pictures with the queens. So thank you. To, I don't know the name. They're the, for you, sweet pea. They're all for you. They're all for you, and uh, they are available. By the way, we put the link in the chat as well. If you're interested to, uh, I have the books from Tamara uh, from the English Schoolhouse. We could check them out. You can order them as well. We have the link in the chat. Then, of course, we have from Maria Luisa, and it's a. Uh, to say like, oh yeah, bravissima. Second, the echo is in the bad, so don't worry. And the nature is of this current reality, like yeah, of the Zoom. So tangibly, we have spoken about this briefly before, but love to hear the process of the research, storytelling, and folklore rendering, especially when you don't know much about culture, identity, and heritage. And I'm still learning about being Jamaican. Thank you so much for sharing that. Then we have also Rhonda that she shared about this ex ex exquisite soul food. Congratulations, Tamara. Thank you so much. And we have here again the link in the chat. And uh, please, if you have any questions, let us know. Please drop, drop it in the chat. We still have a few minutes. We have about a minute. And um, I don't know if Tamara, you want to like anything, but please, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Yeah, just some things that I would like to say that um, for anyone who's a writer, uh, quietly or or um, or would like to be that you, I believe in everyone just greenlighting themselves. I didn't have any professional training, or I just started and self-published, and um, you just have to honor your good ideas, and we all have them. We all have them. That's so important. So we have more questions in the chat. Uh, so would this event be recorded? Yes, it will be recorded. We we'll work from the audio as well, but we should have it available on our website. If there are any issues, of course, the, um, the show will be available. Uh, online and if you happen to be in Rome, please uh, do come and visit the gallery. We have the link in the chat and also we have the link in the chat for our YouTube channel as well. And you can also check our Facebook page. And uh, yeah, we have more compliments here as well. I don't want to mispronounce your name, but I believe it's French share. And she said, this is us, this is awesome, Tame. And then uh, Stephanie Hi, Burns said, yes. And Stephanie said, thank you, Tamara. It's always great to hear your wisdom. We have Shantara McBride. Uh, she, was, yes, she, of course, I liked it to honor your good ideas. So don't forget for the students here, whichever position you are, faculty, staff, and attendees, please don't forget that. Take that for the precious advice. Also, we can I interject one thing? Yes. So I, I know a wonderful woman by the name of Lema Bowie. She's a Nobel Peace Prize laureate. And I heard her speak one time in New York. And she said, something that stayed with me from the first time she spoke the word. She said that the vision bearer is the vision carrier. The vision bearer is the vision carrier. So if something comes to you, it's because it, it wants to come through you. That I know. And so really, I feel like we waste a lot of time wanting to get other people's opinions or ideas, what do you think? I mean, it's fine to get feedback, but you, you know when you're on to something. 
you know? And when you know that you're onto something, do it. Because for me, I don't really waste a lot of time complaining about things I don't, that I see that I don't like because I'm really busy trying to change what I see. So if we all put our energies and efforts into making the most of the talents that we've been given to positively affect change, then there will be a lot less to complain about, I think. Yes, thank you so much, Samara. That's also another important insight and input as well of the part of pretty energy is so complete the fact to create like change. I think that's also very important of the image uh, image bearer. So uh, we have we're coming to the end of the event. So let me read some some. The last few comments. So we have Maria Luisa, and she said, I have many questions. We need more than an hour, but I want to say I love how you emphasize on Black excellence and, ce and celebration. You are incredible. I wish I had a writer like you when I was a kid, but glad to know you now. That's great. Thank you so much, Maria Luisa. And then we also have, what do we have here in the chat? So we have some reminders here in the chat. Uh, let me just see before I miss any comments. So yes, we have some, okay, we have someone that raised their hand. Um, I, believe it's, it's, I don't know me. this woman, no, I'm joking. <laughs> Fresh share, I believe. Please go ahead and ask us a question. You can type it in the chat as well. Frontier is, okay, I know Frontier is so Lisa wrote about, I'm gonna pick up Lisa. Uh, oh, like Frisha said she is by accident, that's fine. We have Lisa, I'm going to pick up your question back up. Okay, so she commented, she said, Tamara, I'm so happy. Years old. Say that again? Thank you, babe. <laughs> Don't worry. So I uh, got like here we have like Tamara, I'm so happy to see and hear you and forever grateful I met you at X Circus. You are a movement light on life. And I'm grateful for the reminder that the good is there and also around us, especially now when times are wild in the in the US. And you just started talking about what I wanted to ask about. How to get past the fear of being vulnerable and just tell your story. I, I, I will quote that question I, I also I'm asking it myself, I guess. So like, yeah, <laughs> Tamara, like, yes. So yeah, how do you start talking about your story and the fear of being vulnerable? I think at some point, the it's like, it's like water swelling and you know that it has to go somewhere. And so the fear of, it's not even fear, it's just, um, well, for me, my own personal journey to the, the truth of myself and being vulnerable enough to share that with other people without caring, honestly, what they think, my stories are very personal and I've experienced a lot of grief. Um, a lot of a lot of real grief. So I feel like, you know, my sister passed away in 2014, then the divorce and the custody thing, and then I mean just just Italy sometimes, <laughs> you know, you're away and being, you know, American and missing home. And but it's kind of like you feel like you, you're running and hitting this brick wall, right? And you're just cracking and well, maybe walls keep hitting you, it feels like in life sometimes, but that really is to like any shell that you have, that you, any, anything that you've built, anything you've encased yourself in and you hold yourself, it's life trying to chip away at that. So that 
finally, I could cry. <laughs> so that finally you can, you can do this. Thank you so much, Tamara, for sharing that in this moment of uh, It's terrifying, but it's also exhilarating and it's beautiful and it's life, you know? And I think so many people aren't living, they're just existing, especially now. And I think art saves, beauty saves, um, stories save, the truth saves. And uh, if I think if people only knew how fun it is, you know, like, yes, it's terrifying. But once you finally do it, Absolutely. And I'm sure like many people have been inspired. I've been inspired. I've been taking notes as if it's a lecture or a sermon because this is just so much wisdom be shared here. And uh, thank you so much for this and all of this my camera is leaving me. Like yeah, but like yeah. So thank you so much for sharing. Oh, this thank time. you. I'm I'm very grateful. Truly. Yes. Yes, I'm also very grateful right now for this moment and this opportunity. Uh, we have Marie Louisa, who said, brilliant. Thank you, everyone, for this amazing event. So glad I made it. Thank you, Maria Louisa, for being Hi, here. Hi, Marie Lou, I love you. <laughs> That's so great. And like we have one of our students, Emily, she said, thank you. Thank you for sharing your beautiful art and story. Oh, and my goodness. Yeah, that's so great. So as we're talking about art, we want to remind you tomorrow we have music uh, with that's uh, right, and we have a, we will have a live performance. It will be by Zoom. Please register yourself for this event tomorrow. As we're talking about art, and moment is celebration of Black Joy. Please join us tonight. We also have Boris. Boris Akim Aka that joined us tonight is also an artist and will be with us on February 23rd at 8 p.m. So please also register, find the link in the chat. And like, yeah, thank you so much for everybody that's attended. Uh, please check our website and our pages for any recordings and any like uh, live performances. So thank you everybody so much for attending. Tamara. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs>